channel of this um, uh, very uh, fruitful and successful forum on resilience. Our panel is about climate change. We link the, link the topic to resilience, but also in the context of marine uh, ecosystem. I'm uh, uh, Delia Dimitriou. I represent your student at Natura 5, so research and NGO. And uh, I'm honored to be one of the moderators together with uh, uh, Her Excellency Ambassador Cornel Ferruzza, permanent representative of Romania to the United Nations from New York. So this panel is a duplex. So we have to, uh, hopefully the technology will help us to synchronize uh, um, the uh, speakers from Bucharest and New York. We have five speakers in, in the panel. And uh, then we have debate. So please prepare for the Q&A session because the topic is extremely interesting. Apart from talking about um, awareness, climate and resilience in different contexts, uh, apart from talking about strategies and, and action plans, because in Bucharest we have a policy maker um, through uh, Ionut Sorin Banchu, Secretary of State from the Romanian Minister of uh, Environment, for Water and Forest. We also will be talking about disinformation, misinformation, and we have experts in Bucharest, Jenny King, um, head of climate research and policy with the Institute of St uh, Strategic Dialogue, and Melissa Fleming from New York, uh, who is the director of the United Nations Office for, no, um, head of climate, sorry. Melissa Fleming and the Secretary General for Global Communication. So um, the main objectives, yeah, is about information, but also we expect actions to align and assign to what we will hear today. And as a takeaway, we hope to foster some cooperation. I give now the floor to New York, to Mr. Cornel Peruzza, our ambassador. Please, the floor is yours. Uh, good afternoon, good morning from New York. And thank you very much, Dr. Dimitri. We'll, uh, actually, this is a triplex, I guess, because we'll have a connection with Geneva as well. Um, in spite of the uh, weather conditions. I checked the temperature in Bucharest. It's 26 centigrades. There are 15 centigrades in New York and it's pouring rain. And uh, that affected a bit um, the uh, turn, uh, turnout here in New York. Uh, several of our participants are still struggling to get to get to our office in New York, but we are very pleased to, um, to join you at this important forum um, that um, the Euro Atlantic Resilience um, Center is organizing. Um, we are joining from New York with a, and Geneva, actually, with a stellar and brilliant uh, panel. I'm very pleased, actually, to, to welcome in our midst um, Under Secretary General Melissa Fleming, who is the uh, Under Secretary General for Global Communications at the UN. Um, I would say one of the heavyweights in global communications worldwide. And I had the pleasure of uh, interacting with Melissa uh, for many years. We will have uh, Mrs. Paula Alberto, Director of the United Nations Office for Disaster Risk Reduction. Um, coming in from Geneva, and we have here with us um, Mr. Jamil Ahmad, who is the director of the United Nations um, Environment Program um, in the New York office. Now, um, we are fresh from the high-level week, last week, when many leaders, uh, both in the uh, General Assembly statements, they talked quite a lot and extensively, uh, passionately sometimes, about the uh, some of the issues that we're tackling here. Uh, in addition to the uh, debate in the General Assembly, there was a separate uh, climate ambition summit organized by the Secretary General, which tackled some of the issues. And of course, it's an um, um, eye-opener to listen to the many leaders around the world um, in uh, framing that particular conversation that we are continuing nowadays, and to see and to witness the in security impact the sea level rise, the climate change, the um, uh, security implications for the societies, for the countries, and for the um, um, for the efforts that we all try to develop in our own countries to uh, to bolster our green transition. Now, the good news from last week is that we can encapsulate that common message that was shared through the General Assembly debates and the Climate Ambition Summit 
uh, and take it forward in different formats. Um, what is important is that there is this commitment at the highest level to accelerate the green transition towards the net zero target. Um, and I think the various sets of state and government from different parts of the world, they did share some of the uh, best practices at the national level, cooperation at the regional level, and also expectations at the global level. And Romania, I think, also contributed. I, we look forward here in New York to, uh, to hear from, from, um, from uh, State Secretary um, uh, Abanchu from the Ministry of the Environment. Our president made it quite clear, and I think Romania is also one of the countries that is accelerating the green transition. And we have very ambitious targets by 2030. Most of them have been met already, but also we made clear that we can share through our own experience, uh, we can share through our interaction, um, the um, lessons that we have learned and the uh, different situations that uh, we are um, uh, witnessing. I will not go in, into details, but one, one key aspect that, uh, that we have in mind is to uh, continue working with uh, small islands developing states. For many of them, and we have in mind still fresh in our memory, the debates in the Security Council this year in February, uh, an important debate organized by Malta during its presidency of the Security Council on, on sea level rise and security implications. And uh, that's the desperate message we get from many of the interventions. For many countries, sea level rise, it's a serious security matter. It's a matter of survival. And that's why it's important how we become more resilient, how we prevent uh, that issue to, um, um, to become a life or death uh, particular situation. Um, and we've been also at the forefront as Romania together in the core group actually of the countries uh, seeking an advisory opinion to International Court of Justice on, on climate change, working with Vanuatu from the beginning, from more than a year ago until the moment it was passed in the General Assembly uh, this spring. And definitely we are looking forward and will contribute actively to the debates in, um, in, um, uh, in, in the uh, ICJ. Um, and we have um, climate change um, um, effects and consequences being also influenced heavily, massively, in many of our countries by disinformation or misinformation. There are many narratives that try to change the, the angle or um, misuse or abuse somehow this important topic that it's, it's here. We hear quite, quite frequently um, pushbacks from, from some of the uh, very influential actors um, saying that what is happening is not the impact climate change. And we'll discuss about that here as well. But this is uh, for the introduction from, from New York, uh, Dr. Dimitri, and we'll we relay that uh, back to you and uh, we look forward to the conversation, also to the exchange. We, we still have people coming in in New York as well, and I would definitely encourage a free flow conversation and question uh, and answers. Thank you very much. Thank you. So uh, our first speaker is uh, Mr. Ionu Sorinbancho, Secretary of State from the Romanian Ministry of Environment, Waters and uh, Forest. And the perspective is about strategies and integration, national strategies, integration in the region and agreements. And then during the debate, we'll have more time to ask questions or to clarify some other ideas. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Bucharest, Romania. Good morning, uh, New York. Happy to see my colleague Ambassador Feruza as a facilitator and moderator of this uh, uh, triplex. Um, I know that I only have 10 minutes and this is an issue when we talk about climate change, the impact strategies and action plans. But um, I'm really happy that we are taking climate change um, as a topic and resilience in this wider complex because resilience of communities is heavily dependent on the resilience of ecosystems. And uh, in Romania, in the Ministry of Environment, Waters and Forests, we are taking these topics uh, at strategic level. Uh, we are developing uh, our first long-term strategy. Uh, we are uh, at the point where we are preparing a governmental decision to um, offer a vision for climate neutrality in Romania by 2050. 
Romania has performed very well in terms of, uh, of uh, mitigation. We have uh, um, reduced our emissions with two thirds compared to 1990s. But Romania is also a country that is affected by climate change. And uh, uh, putting this into a context of oceans and seas, uh, we have to remind ourselves that a big part of our planet is formed by oceans and seas and addressing the problems that seas and oceans are facing. And I'm talking about climate change impacts, but also pollution and biodiversity loss is the only way we can improve resilience because I can't see how our communities will be resilient if our ecosystems are not resilient. And um, uh, this is why I want to, to salute the uh, agreement that was reached in uh, New York um, last days where Romania has joined the, the agreement on biodiversity beyond nature jurisdictions because even if we are not a country that has a direct contact, contact with the ocean, we are um, commonly responsible for what's happening beyond our national jurisdictions. And of course, climate change, biodiversity loss and pollution are issues that can't be dealt only at national level. Romania, besides the long-term strategy that will be officially approved soon, is working heavily to an adaptation strategy together with our colleagues in the uh, Meteorological Administration. Uh, both strategies will help us define priorities in terms of reducing loss, uh, addressing, uh, addressing risks related to climate change, but also reducing emissions because um, we know the discussions that take place at, uh, at the climate COPs. We know that we need to address loss and damage, but in the same time, loss and damage, the costs of addressing loss and damage will be higher if the emissions will not be reduced. So uh, um, I want to bring this, uh, this perspective, the, the resilience of ecosystems, why we need to protect forests, but not only forests, also a big part of our uh, ocean biodiversity, because oceans are extremely relevant for the whole climate system. And I see here experts in that can uh, that can present this even in more details. Oceans are uh, um, a contributor to the climate system. They are affected by climate change. Um, raising sea levels are um, issues that are visible. And uh, I'm also very happy that we, uh, besides this uh, component of, of resilience and security in terms of climate change, we also talk about communication and risk of misinformation because we have strategies, we have agreements, we have national plans, but we need the political will to implement them. And this is where it is clear that, that there's no time to delay, there's no time to negotiate details. It is the time for action. And action has to be supported by our societies. If our societies do not understand why we need to act in a certain way, and if they will not back up our political decisions, these agreements will only stay on paper. And uh, um, we have a triple planetary crisis. Uh, Romania is positioned in a very sensitive geopolitical area. We have this uh, crisis. We have an overlapping, overlapping security crisis. We have agreements in the Black Sea that are not functional because now we have a federation that uh, blocks almost everything at all levels. And we need to take this into consideration. Um, I was uh, also thinking about uh, the what the UN is proposing this uh, this agreement, legally binding agreement on plastic pollution and microplastic pollution, which seems disconnected from the general topic of climate change, but is extremely connected with it. And uh, Romania is supporting this, uh, this agreement. We have joined this high ambition coalition on, on reducing plastic pollution. And we hope that next year in uh, in uh, UNEA 6, uh, we will have a, a good shape of this agreement and Romania uh, will support it. I don't want to, I know I have 10 minutes, but uh, I would like uh, better that we have an open discussion and a dialogue. So uh, I, will, uh, I will stop here and uh, I will be happy to answer any further questions that will come during our panel today. Thank you. 
thank you very much. Uh, indeed, we'll have some questions about the implementation of these uh, demanding strategies during the Q&A session. I invite now New York for the uh, second speaker, please, because we've seen the national and regional perspective, but now we're turning to the UN perspective. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, and before giving the floor to the next speaker, about I'm very glad that Secretary of State Pancho raised the um, uh, BBNJ, uh, the Treaty Beyond National Jurisdiction. It was good news that last week, 80 countries and the European Union signed the treaty. And I think this shows quite a lot that there is a momentum. And in a short time span, since uh, the conclusion of the negotiations until September, there were only a couple of months. And 80 countries signed, and that means this gives um, a good impetus for the ratification process. So um, we take the conversation forward and I, I do have the pleasure in, uh, to introduce our first speaker from New York, uh, Mr. Jamil Ahmad, who is the director of the United Nations Environment Program and, and in the New York office. Uh, Mr. Ahmad leads the work on sustainable development and the environment in support of the organization's policies and programs. He's a very well established uh, diplomat, uh, uh, but also um, a very uh, uh, solid professional on environment protection. So uh, Mr. Ahmad, I'll give you the floor, please. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador, Excellencies, uh, distinguished participants. A very good morning uh, to you and a good afternoon to all those who are in other time zones. Um, thank you to the Euro Atlantic Resilience Center for uh, this uh, organizing this event on this very important issue. Uh, we just heard um, how important the uh, marine ecosystem and the resilience of ecosystem is to the overall um, agenda of, uh, of of climate change and biodiversity loss or pollution or all other planetary crises that we are facing today. Um, water, uh, marine ecosystems are a key uh, challenge uh, when we try to address climate change. Uh, we, we agreed in Paris that we will try to uh, reduce global greenhouse gas emissions to um, below 2.5 uh, uh, degrees uh, Celsius, preferably to the pre-industrial level, but we have failed in that. Um, the latest IPCC reports and other findings of scientific community tell us that we are off track. Uh, our own uh, UNEP emission gaps report uh, also highlight that we'll have to take a very urgent, uh, effective and sustained action uh, to limit the greenhouse gas emission by 45% by 2030 if we are to reach and keep the 1.5 degrees uh, target alive. So in these circumstances, it is all the more important that we uh, take to the center stage in addressing uh, marine ecosystems. As we heard from the speaker, that the resilience of people will depend on the resilience of marine ecosystem. Uh, at UNEP, we have uh, the global partnership for protecting the marine ecosystems from land-based activities because, as we uh, know, uh, one of the biggest threat to the uh, to the life or to the health of marine ecosystems is pollution from land-based activities. Uh, although uh, pollution from sea-based uh, activities also contributes, but the amount of plastic, the amount of trash, the amount of chemicals, the amount of waste that goes into uh, our waterways and then from that uh, ends up in the ocean uh, is uh, affecting uh, life of coastal communities and life of communities who depend on uh, on, on, on marine um, economies, on blue economies. 850 million people live um, within uh, 100 kilometers of coral reefs and marine biodiversity. So they all depend on, uh, in a big way, on this. Um, we are facing sea level rise. We are facing uh, temperature rise in, 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 in oceans. Uh, the oceans have been um, hottest uh, now uh, in the past year ever recorded. And these are all uh, threatening the marine life also, but also the life of people who depend on uh, marine ecosystems. The good news that we have just heard is that uh, we have concluded after many, many years, the uh, BBNJ Treaty and uh, 80 plus countries have already signed it. Uh, I hope it will follow the suit of the Paris Agreement, which was the fastest treaty uh, in the history of the UN to come to uh, operation 
uh, as countries signed and ratified it within uh, in, in less than one year. Um, the challenge would still remain for implementation, because even if we if we uh, ratify it and sign it and 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 make it part of our national laws, uh, it will be a challenge to implement it. So the UN will continue to work with governments. Uh, we at the United Nations Environment Program have several partnerships with governments on various aspects of uh, marine ecosystem, the Kunming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework, uh, which is another achievement of multilateral democracy, uh, di diplomacy under the UN's umbrella last year, uh, falls in the same category where UNEP is heavily involved in, in bringing to the table the, the issues of, uh, of marine ecosystems. We are also looking forward to uh, the completion and the finally approval of the Plastics Treaty, which will be a globally binding legal treaty for the first time, which will address plastic from source to end uh, in a life cycle approach. And also the UNEA meeting uh, in February, March, early, early next year will be an occasion for the uh, United Nations community and also for international community to finalize and give final touches to this important treaty. But in the end, what is important is the imperative of urgent sustained action on climate change and all uh, planetary issues. COP28 will be a litmus test in that sense uh, for countries to, uh, to take forward the agreements that were agreed in the previous COPs and also uh, to operationalize not only the loss and damage fund uh, which was one of the key achievements of the previous COP, but also to uh, take lessons from the global stock tick that is happening this year for the first time and which has given some key indications of the areas where action needs to be expedited. So UNEP will stand ready to uh, support member states in these efforts through our scientific work, through our assessments and through our partnerships. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ahmad, and also for um, reiterating the important, uh, you know, message uh, to uh, UN member states and to the community that UNEP uh, stands by all these efforts, but also to highlight uh, some of the key challenges because we don't have answers to everything that we are looking at. We have a discussed and probably would add a conversation, interesting conversation yesterday with one of the policy shapers, um, non-governmental policy shapers on the uh, Atoll Islands. Uh, which actually brings into the conversation a completely new dimension. But we move from New York with our agreement, we move to, to Geneva, to um, uh, who will be our second speaker. We'll have our second speaker from, from Geneva, Mrs. Paula Albrito. Uh, she's the director of the United Nations Office for Disaster uh, Risk Reduction. Um, Mrs. Albrito has been working with the, um, with the um, agency um, for um, uh, more than uh, 10 years. Um, and I think she's been actively involved in uh, disaster reduction efforts at the UN level. And um, I would uh, definitely uh, looking forward uh, myself to, uh, to get uh, her insights. Mrs. Albrito, you have the floor, please. Thank you very much. And uh, excellencies and colleagues, good afternoon from Geneva. I'm very happy to share with you um, how we can work together in order to reduce the impact of climate change on coastal areas and the uh, uh, marine ecosystem. As the average global temperature has increased already to 1.1 degrees Celsius, climate change is, uh, is rapidly changing the disaster risk profile of the planet. And what we see is that there is an increase in the magnitude, the frequency, the severity of the number of extreme weather events. As a result, climate-related disasters have doubled over the last 20 years period. And this impacts many coastal communities, but can have an especially devastating effect on small island development states. Complicating the matter are also the loss in biodiversity, as we have heard, and decline of ecosystem on land and water as a result of the rising of sea level, but also the escalating ocean temperature and the acidification of the ocean which exacerbates what are the vulnerability of the coastal community and will arm sectors such as fishery, tourism, but also agriculture. It really touches upon the entire sector chain. These risks are varied, but they are very much connected and, and they have a cascade effect one from the other. 
This is why it is important to apply a disaster risk reduction lens for our holistic approach to manage risks that coastal community and ecosystem are currently facing. On this, uh, disaster risk reduction sits um, at the nexus of the climate, development, humanitarian, and environmental policies. And the connection among these different agenda is strategically fundamentally important. One key recommendation we have um, is to support countries and discuss with countries how best they can adopt what is called a comprehensive risk management approach. This means really breaking silos that separate the different sectors for a unified approach that focuses on addressing vulnerability and the impact on the ground. With this, we can ensure the sectors are working in synergy, but also minimizing the overlap. We already referred to, to uh, the limited financing that we have, but also making sure that we increase the impact. Um, and as a result, countries would be able to avert, minimize, and address loss and damage. The value of the comprehensive risk management is already recognized in the global framework, whether it is the Sendai framework for disaster risk reduction, the Paris climate agenda, the SDGs, and of course, the Kunming Montreal global biodiversity framework. What is missing is a wide scale adoption on the ground. What we hope is that this can be one of the key activities supported by the Santiago Network when it is operationalized. For our side, UNDRR has been uh, pioneering this approach in over 35 countries, bringing together different ministries and sectors. A second recommendation is around strengthening the data that these different sectors need to develop in order to have informed plans. Uh, this goes to one of UNDRR's central goals, which is to help countries better understand their risks so they can act on them. Uh, and indeed, one of our commitments um, at the 2023 Water Conference is to strengthen the availability and access to data on water-related disasters to help countries prevent future disasters. One initiative that uh, we are really promoting and we are proud of is the work to create a new generation tracking of systems for disaster losses. This is not done on our own. It is in collaboration with UNDP and WMO. And we really hope that this new system will provide countries with a more comprehensive tracking system that will cover both the hazards event, but also the disaggregated losses and damages and at localized scales. Therefore, it will allow to provide countries with an historical basis that can be combined with climate and environmental projections use in risk management. Third recommendation is uh, around enhancing infrastructure resilience. As damage and disruption to infrastructure system are a major contribution to disaster economic losses for coastal community, and it is a reality, resilient infrastructure can really help to prevent disasters. Um, we have just learned very recently that the down power of the lines provided the spark for the devastating uh, world fire in the US state of Hawaii. Data that is reported in the Sendai Framework Monitor shows that in average there are 103,000 critical infrastructure units that are destroyed and damaged by disaster every year. This is one of the reasons why we are working together with the government of India in the launch uh, to an initiative that was launched in 2019 at the Climate Action Summit, which is called the Global Coalition for Disaster Resilience Infrastructure. So at the moment, we are really supporting countries in order to conduct um, infrastructure resilience review, which is aligned with the UNDRR principle for resilient infrastructure. Last element, which is uh, extremely important, and this is the last but not the least, is that really we recommend to all countries, especially those in vulnerable coastal communities, to act upon the UN Secretary General Early Warning for All Initiative, which we are very proud to co-lead. This is something that was very uh, clearly also highlighted during the high level week. The initiative aims to ensure that every person on earth is covered by an early warning system by 2027. And we also know that the early warning systems are one of the most effective climate adaptation 
and disaster reduction measures for saving lives and reducing economic losses. Unfortunately, we also know that only half of the countries do have this multi-hazard early warning system. Working with partners, we are moving ahead in implementing uh, the initiative in 30 countries. But of course, this is only an initial rollout. We are talking about touching upon uh, worldwide and entire communities. And on this, I'm actually glad to report that this initiative has also won the support of the G7 and the G20. Um, on this note, I also would like to acknowledge the government of Romania for your championing and strengthening of risk communication and combating misinformation uh, at the European level. This is part of uh, your commitment or the commitment you made to the implementation of the regional roadmap agreed at the 2021 European Forum for Disaster Reduction, for which we are extremely grateful. Um, we know that trusted, accurate, and timely risk information save lives, especially when it comes to bridging the last mile of the early warning system. And it is crucial that risk information is understandable and accessible to everyone who is at risk to enable them to take proactive action. These four recommendations um, somehow are very much related among each other. Whether we take the climate perspective, the environment perspective, the SDG, the livelihood, the climate change perspective. But what we need to do is really to ensure the scaling up. And for this, my last consideration is collaboration and partnership. Without strong collaboration and partnerships and holding hands, we are not going to be able to reach the scale that is now needed in order to be able to, to manage the impact of the challenge that uh, we have ahead. We do have the power to prevent hazards from becoming disasters, but only if we decide to make it a priority. And, uh, I will give the floor back to you over this consideration and very much looking forward to the interaction session. Thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Alberto, for, for this important contribution and highlighting uh, some of the key features. Um, I'm afraid that your office is going to be uh, requested and required more and more to provide support and assistance to member states of the UN. Um, we see the devastating impact of extreme weather conditions. We just discussed this week in the General Assembly about one year after the floods in, um, in Pakistan. And one of the key lessons we take from here is that um, the um, solidarity is important, but also capacity building and sharing best practices. And I also acknowledge the important interaction we have with, with the UNDRR as Romania, and not only in, in improving and change exchange of practices, but also to increase capacity building in many other countries, especially small island developing states and low lying uh, coastal states. So uh, that's an important work. And with this, I would uh, relate that uh, um, connection back to Bucharest and um, uh, please, uh, Dr. Dimitriou. Thank you. So far, we've heard about policies, strategies, action plans, pollution, uh, marine ecosystems, uh, disaster risk uh, reductions, and data. We will move now to the second part of our panel to discuss about the importance of right information, a right source, and how can we identify a right from false, and how can false information or fake disinformation can delay some actions or impact on several other stakeholders' representatives. So I invite uh, uh, Jenny King, our expert on uh, misinformation and disinformation. You'll enjoy her slides. Um, she's the head of Climate Research and Policy Institute of Strategic Dialogue. Thank you very much for having me today. And I'm very appreciative to the forum for allowing me to contribute through the lens of mis- and disinformation. I am certainly biased but I think that it is impossible to disentangle information resilience or the strength of our information systems from achieving progress on climate change. And I hope that in the next 10 minutes, I can, if you are skeptical of that connection, that I can convince you as to why those things are so inextricably linked with each other. 
as Mr. Banshu said right at the beginning in his address, climate action or achieving progress on climate change, mitigating its worst effects, adapting to the consequences we're already seeing, are absolutely dependent on a strong public mandate. But you cannot have a public mandate without a shared sense of reality and an understanding of the viable pathways to decarbonization, to achieving net zero, including the trade-offs that are inherent in those pathways. Now, our information at the environment at the moment is arguably making that impossible, and it's actually getting more difficult by the day. In 2022, it was the first time ever that a report from the IPCC recognized this problem explicitly. They recognized that missing disinformation, and in particular, the politicization of science, was a key barrier to action. And just to quote them, they said, vested economic and political interests have generated rhetoric and misinformation that undermines climate science and disregards risk and urgency, and that ultimately public misperception of climate risks and polarized public support was weakening consensus and extending the timeline to achieve meaningful progress. What I would say, and my organization does not only look at climate, we are really very broad based, is that Climate change as a topic has been the victim of a trend that has befallen a number of other key policy issues. Migration, public health, sexual and reproductive rights, racial justice. And this trend was so clearly observed and in fact turbocharged during the COVID-19 pandemic. And what you find in that environment is that climate has increasingly become a lightning rod for conspiracism and for social division for mistrust of institutions, and ultimately for exploiting the fractures that exist in society. The way that we would refer to it, and I think that this language has been used at various points in the summit, is that climate is a focal point in a hybridized threat landscape. And what that means is that you see traditional climate deniers, the actors that we've been aware of since the 1970s, merging with a much broader universe of extremist movements, of conspiracist movements, of commercial disinformation actors, of outrage merchants, and of the more extreme fringes of our political systems around the world. And so within that, you also have this, this persistent information challenge. I'm gonna skip this slide for the sake of time, but in order to talk about a problem at all, and I hope that we are going to discuss this at length in the, in the Q&A, we need to have common parameters for what we mean when we say climate mis- and disinformation. That has also been a big issue to date, is that it's been a very ambiguous or nebulous topic. And I think that there is still a relatively narrow conception of the problem, which relates exclusively to climate denialism. Now that content still exists, you know, people who want to say that climate change is not a real phenomenon and that therefore it doesn't necessitate action. But actually, public opinion has shifted enormously over the last 10 to 15 years. And that kind of content does not have the same social license that it did even in 2010. You know, if you went out into most societies and said, I don't believe climate change exists, it would not have a lot of currency with the general public. And in fact, I saw a, a poll from Eurobarometer last week that said among their surveyed participants, 93% believed in climate change and wanted some form of action. So. It's still important to recognize denialism and particularly denialism when it's laundered into polite conversation. But I actually think there's a much bigger problem, which is the persistent and critical gap that exists between recognizing a problem and doing something about that problem. So we might have public consensus on the reality of climate change, but that will not automatically, and indeed to date it has not, translated into the level of legislative agendas and policy that are actually needed to meet the goals of the Paris Agreement, to, you know, to, um, to comply with the warnings of, of the IPCC reports, et cetera. I, I often call that gap the final mile. And that is where information warfare is now targeted, is in the difference between a broad understanding of the problem and actually having measures in place, mechanisms in place that push us forward into dealing with that problem. Much of the content um, that I'm talking about sits under pillar two of the definition that I have on the screen here. So these are subtler efforts to sow doubt among citizens, among voters, 
to discredit institutions, that's very crucial, who are at the forefront of debating climate policy and action, including I'm sure some of the people in this room may well have been victim to those kind of attacks, and ultimately to delay real progress beyond the current status quo. Within that, you kind of have a subcategory of content, which is the persistent challenge of, of greenwashing. And actors who have recognized this new reality, they know that they need to be seen as progressive on climate. They want to have the support of the general public for their business practices. And so they try to present themselves as champions of the green agenda, when in fact their objective is to push non-transformative solutions. They want to maintain reliance on the carbon economy, and ultimately they want to weaken the resolve for more ambitious action. So when I talk about climate mis and disinformation or information warfare in the climate space, I am really thinking about these three distinct pillars and how you might deal with each of those because they are actually all quite nuanced in their own way. And you cannot have a broad based approach that is going to tackle all three of these in tandem. The next important factor is who is engaged in this? Who is spreading information warfare around climate? And I think, again, there is a risk of having a very narrow conception that this is just the oil and gas companies, for example. The people who we know have been operating since the 1970s in a very coordinated and professionalized way to both mislead the public and to influence public opinion. And they are absolutely still relevant, but there is, actually, there is a much broader set of actors who are converging on this space. And there are a range of ideological, political, and financial incentives at play that go beyond just wanting to generate business for your company. So yes, we still have vested interests. We still have all of the sector lobbyists, and in particular, their vast extended network of front and lobby groups, of sponsored think tanks, academics who provide them with a kind of veneer of credibility, the social media influencers that they work with. All of those things are still happening, and it is billions of dollars worth of investment that is going into that every year. It is a very disciplined ecosystem with very focused objectives. Sitting alongside that, you now increasingly have hostile state interference and information warfare that is coming from particular governments. In the context of Europe, you can't really ignore the pro-Kremlin aspect of that. And from the research that we are doing, not only in Europe, but also in sub-Saharan Africa and in the US, I can tell you that one of the main narrative framings at the moment used by pro-Kremlin networks is your government cares more about climate than it does about you as citizens. It's an incredibly resonant and incredibly effective message to try and drive a wedge into countries overseas not only to delay climate action, but also to weaken democratic processes. So there is a kind of, there is a strategic advantage there. Oh, minute, oh my gosh. And then the final ecosystem is, is the online attention economy. And this is a large part of what I research at ISD. These are people who maybe never cared about climate before, are actually not invested in any particular solution. But as climate has become incorporated within the culture wars, they see a profit value and an incentive for spreading mis and disinformation in the online space because it generates li licks, generates likes, generates likes, it generates comments, it generates shares. And as a result, if you are a professional mis or disinformer, you can generate advertising revenue, you can merchandise, you can cultivate your personal brand, you can steer people towards subscription content. So there is now this kind of wider trial and error in the online space of just weaponizing climate in very cynical ways to increase your audience. And where I guess I will finish, um, I want to talk a little bit in the Q&A about the policy solutions to this, but where I'll finish is this is not exclusively about delaying climate action. And I cannot emphasize that enough is maybe for some of the other speakers, you know, that is the most relevant factor here is that you want to disrupt legislative and regulatory agendas. And I don't want to discount that that is happening. That is a key end goal of many of these campaigns. But there is also a wider goal here. And it's the way that climate can be used to erode democratic norms and to fuel division, not only between citizens in a given country, but also between countries around the world to prey upon geopolitical tensions, to say, for example, the net zero agenda is a Western imperialist agenda. It is a new form of neo-colonialism. 
And as a result, you shouldn't engage in COP. You shouldn't believe in the Paris Agreement. And instead, you should maintain your fossil fuel economies. So both of these things are sitting in tandem. And when we talk about tackling the issue of climate mis and disinformation, it's not only about protecting and preserving the environment and moving forward on climate action, but it's also about safeguarding the fundamental norms of democracy and of multilateralism as a principle. Um, and I, I look forward to discussing both of those in further detail. Thank you very much. Of course, we will start the, um, the debate with this because I'm sure the captivating for the audience, particularly that several meanings can be drawn out of uh, what you've just explained um, about the threats particularly. I give now the floor to New York uh, for our last uh, speaker. Thank you very much. I'm uh, I'm still pondering, and and the last presentation it gives uh, quite a significant uh, food for thought, I would say. But there's also there's also a very good transition to um, uh, the next uh, the keynote speaker of our session here in New York, and the Secretary General Melissa Fleming. As I said, she's very well versed into global communication in general, and I think she's at the forefront of efforts uh, within the UN system in general to uh, try to communicate better, but also to um, uh, to push back on disinformation, misinformation. And I have to say that from a member state perspective, we are quite fortunate to have Melissa uh, leading these efforts because um, part of the success of the communication strategy is uh, owed to, to her. So um, Melissa, please, you have the floor. Thank you, Ambassador Faruta, for those kind words, uh, excellencies in, in Bucharest and ladies and gentlemen here, my dear colleagues. And uh, Jenny King, um, thank you for that fascinating presentation, which very much aligns uh, with some of our thinking and our concerns. But first, I just want to like emphasize, perhaps from the Secretary General's and the UN's uh, perspective, how we we're talking about the ocean today, too, right? So the ocean we consider the lungs of the planet, also its largest carbon sink. Um, and as such, a vital buffer against the impacts of climate change. Um, so the stakes are though even higher than that. The ocean uh, is the foundation of life. It, it supplies the air we breathe and the food we eat. It regulates our climate and weather. And I don't know if our community, I mean, this is what we're trying to emphasize in our communications. People need to understand how vital the ocean is. And the Secretary General has called for the world to put the ocean first. Um, it is embraced in Sustainable Development Goal 14, Life Below Water. And this envisions a world where we conserve and sustainably use the ocean, seas, and marine resources for sustainable de development. And as we've heard from so many speakers, this Sustainable Goal 14 hangs in the balance. And we've also been told what needs to be done, and I won't go into that, um, but obviously uh, we need to transition away from fossil fuels and that needs to be our fundamental message. Uh, but to make these changes, we need everyone on board. And uh, I, I would noted the Secretary of State's comment that you know we have the plans, but we need the political will. And that's really what it comes down to. Um, and the political will um, is, what is at stake um, and we do face, uh, as we heard from, from Jenny King, um, a, a huge foe um, and it isn't just in that non uh, tradition, that, that space which would be enough of the vested interests of the fossil fuel companies who want to continue um, uh, obviously their, their business because they're, they're reaping um, huge benefits and they're pumping continuously billions into advertising, greenwashing, but it is those other, um, I was intrigued by those three circles, um, those other players. So let me just give you our perspective um, on the vested interests who are trying to keep us hooked on, on fuel, uh, fossil fuels. Um, there is, we've been made aware of a, a kind of network, and I'm wondering whether there is part of this network in Romania, um, of, of think tanks and influencer campaigns that called the Atlas Network that have um, been funded by vested interests to give people the illusion that uh, the, some of the information that they are receiving about uh, climate change is from studied 
academic and legitimate sources. Um, so we see, you know, even information there that is denying sea level rise back to the oceans. Um, and also, you know, that mounting sea temperatures are um, just a natural part of a natural cycle. Um, on social media, and this is fueled by the three groups that Jenny outlined, and she also mentioned that social media has is a very convenient mechanism and free for those um, who would like to either uh, confuse, deflect, um, or deny. So the public doesn't back that political will. Um, we're seeing a huge spike in climate denial um, on social media. In fact, at last year's uh, COP, we saw the hashtag climate scam um, at the top uh, of what was trending. And unfortunately, in, uh, in the months that followed, um, things have just gotten worse, uh, particularly on the social media platform that many of us here in New York most use. It's now called X. Um, many of, of, of those who were, um, uh, let's say they were banned um, because of um, how hostile uh, they were and how, how, much they, how much science they were denying are now back in, in full um, strength. You know, this despite also uh, what, what Jenny just mentioned, um, the consensus out there in public polling that people do believe that climate change is real they would like to see something done about it. And yet, because of the way the algorithms work on social media, the, the types of content around climate, um, climate change is, is, um, is fueled with, with outrage. I think you called it the out, outrage, uh, outrage machines um, that algorithms favor. Um, and so you might be seeing these kinds of posts um, in your feeds. Um, I won't repeat that quote um, from the IPCC report, but it was really notable that I think the world has woken up. And I, I understand that Romania is also very much involved in addressing um, mis and disinformation in the climate space and, and beyond. We certainly have woken up um, at the UN to recognize that this is really standing in the way of um, that last mile, as was described, that last mile of getting um, policymakers to really act. So it is, um, as the IPCC said, it is um, dis disinformation actors are deliberately undermining the science. And so there are all kinds of mis misperceptions as a result. Um, so we see you know, similar methods as we saw with, with, um, with big tobacco. And um, one of the things that's really concerning us is the kind of othering of those who are acting for climate, um, a demonization of activists. Um, and this is in, in resulting in, in uh, real life violence. So there's, there are, uh, for example, there was, um, in Germany last July, um, an activist group called Last Generation. A protester was attacked and almost run down by a truck driver and videos of the attack were posted online. And the comments gathered um, hundreds, praised the driver for his actions. Um, now this was not an organic campaign, um, but it gave the impression um, in an organized way that actually people were um, on the side more of those who would suppress those who were taking action. And it gave the impression of climate activists being dangerous and extreme. And this is happening all over um, when climate activists are actually lawfully protesting. Um, so again, I, I don't want to, um, I, I was also just going to say that um, this, and maybe echo just what Jenny said, that what we're seeing is a real um, uh, a, a division and suspicion that is blocking honest conversations. And it's actually stifling uh, people from, we had, I had a conversation with one climate scientist who said, you know, actually people are, according to her surveying, afraid to even talk to their family members about climate change. So that while they might believe it, they're feeling um, 
somehow similar to um, how people are feeling about talking about vaccines because of this outrage machine and because people are politicizing um, climate change to such an extent, um, they're not speaking out and therefore perhaps this isn't translating into the urgency that we need. So those on the side of science and solutions have got to be stronger, bolder, um, and more strategic, um, not just in what we communicate, but how we communicate. Um, we need to be in those spaces where climate disinformation is traveling and also in those information gaps where people are searching. And, you know, obviously we want, we have the IPCC, we have UNEP, uh, we have our disaster re risk reduction colleagues, we have the whole UN system that has, is galvanized to address climate change. Um, and obviously we need to be um, the source of, in, of trusted information on climate. So in my department at, uh, at the UN Secretariat here, we have a small but mighty uh, climate communications team also at UNEP, um, quite a climate communications team. You know, it can't even compare in terms of funding to what vested interests are pouring into doing the opposite of what we're trying to do, which is to inform and also inspire and mobilize global audiences with science-based and solutions-focused information. So one of the, um, you know, obviously we're advocating for more ambition, um, but we're also partnering with, um, with uh, big platforms where we're seeing a lot of, so of disinformation traveling. We're seeing fossil fuel companies placing ads, but still they're willing to uh, elevate uh, authoritative information from the UN. For example, on Google, if you were to Google climate change, um, a few years ago, what you would see at the top of your feet would not be something that uh, would steer you in the direction of science. Now, when you Google climate change, there's a definition by the United Nation and explanations about the causes and effects of climate change in multiple language and pointing back to the UN climate site. So that's just one example. Also, just to point to you, we, we, we have a, um, a very informative app called Act Now, um, which has now um, been downloaded up to uh, over um, 15 million times over the past three years. So we have this whole group of individuals out in the world who are associated with the UN and are taking daily actions um, to address it. And obviously we have the most, I would say, powerful voice we could wish for, and that is the UN Secretary General, Antonio Guterres. From the beginning of his mandate as Secretary General, he has taken upon himself to be an outspoken um, advocate for climate action, day in and day out. Um, but I'd just like to mention one other thing that we're doing, again, because it's, a, it's well enough to study um, how bad things are, but I think we all need to join forces and do something about it in our communications. So during the COVID-19 pandemic, we launched an initiative called Verified in which we um, uh, took the science. It was evolving, of course. It's very similar uh, to, to climate science, although with COVID, it wasn't as definitive as uh, the consensus around climate science. But we were putting out in, um, in, to the public in you know, the content that WHO was producing, guide, public guidance, and in in you know, cool digestible formats that were traveled very well on digital platforms and had a content factory that was churning it out, uh, delivering it to all of our country offices, as well as uh, hundreds of media partners and influencers around the world who really wanted to help. We're seeing the same thing in the climate space. And so we're shifting our verified initiative to climate um, to get, um, people on board who are saying, what can we do to convince our audiences to you know, unlock our voices of concern and to speak out? So we're really hoping that this initiative uh, will make a difference. There is a component in this initiative, which is also media literacy, that is um, called pause, take care before you share. We have evidence that it did um, it did uh, introduce a kind of mantra in people's ears. I'm gonna really scrutinize this information before I share it further. And also be a little bit suspicious 
of what I'm seeing in my news feed. Um, so we'll, we want to roll that out even further. So um, finally, um, as much of this disinformation is traveling on social media platforms, and unfortunately the vast, vast majority of people around the world are getting their information on social media and in is especially young people um we want to shift the the ways digital platforms are are monetizing disinformation and amplifying lies to the other way around we would like to see uh, an, an information ecosystem where facts and solutions are elevated and so we're we're um, under the Secretary General's Our Common Agenda um, initiative. We are leading a process on developing a code of conduct on information integrity, which um, it's not just about climate um, integrity, but it's about the integrity of information, the integrity of science, the pe people's right to receive, to be able to access trusted information and to set, deliver really a message uh, to those who are, um, to, you know, manipulating, uh, uh, you know, people's um, feeds to, um, you know, to to really say enough, enough. Um, we all deserve information ecosystems that are healthy, just like our environment. We need to clean up the pollution and focus on the science and focus on the solutions so that we can address this existential threat to our world, which is climate change. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Melissa. I, I, again, um, very valuable uh, food for thought for our conversation. And while listening to your comments, um, I uh, couldn't uh, help but reflect on the mission of the uh, Euro Atlantic Resilience Center that we have developed in Bucharest, exactly to make sure that the decision makers and policy shapers have access to the information first and foremost, uh, and then to combat this information, how to make our societies more resilient to different challenges we have. And I think we built quite a lot on the lessons learned from the pandemic, how we, uh, we can calibrate our tools to make sure that uh, we define the proper policies and um, not cutting corners. And, and that's very much important. And I think um, uh, Dr. Dimitri was, um, as I have the luxury of still uh, having the, uh, the microphone now, I also have this privilege of um, um, sharing uh, some of the uh, uh, reflections um, after these brilliant presentations. All of them bring a particular dimension into the conversation. I would uh, dare to say that, you know, with us here in New York, and I know that in Bucharest as well, we have uh, professionals with their own angles and of course I would definitely encourage uh, them to uh, contribute to make uh, to, 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 to address questions. Um, Under Secretary General Fleming will not have too much time to uh, spend with us because there are, as, as we are still at the beginning of the day in New York, there are multiple commitments that we have to uh, to attend. Um, and I will um, take um, use this privilege in, in, in asking a question to, uh, to Under Secretary General Fleming especially indeed to get a better sense of the scale of the problem because this information, information and disinformation are part of the same point. But uh, I want to, uh, to pick on your brain, Melissa, to what extent this disinformation delays action at the national or global level uh, to, um, in different formats at the UN, COP28, regional formats to take resolute and you know, definitive action to save the oceans to um, to take action that would uh, reverse the course. And if you could uh, spare a moment, you know, in providing your personal reflection and input on that. Thank you. I think it 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 has a huge influence on delaying action, in my view. Um, if people aren't presented with clear cut information and clear cut solutions, but are rather bombarded with conflicting information um, and, and it, it, they're, they're less likely to take action. It, it's very clear that people become either even paralyzed by some of um, the information that they're, uh, they're receiving or just um, lethargic. Um, so, 
what we need in our communications, and this is uh, the UN communication strategy is principled along three W's. Um, and we do think that this will go a long way to address. Uh, journalism is five W's, who, what, when, where, and why. UN's cause communications is three. What, why care, and what now? And the what is what we do well. We provide the facts. But the problem is uh, statistics are human beings with the tears dried off. You know, people might do not remember facts or they're not attracted to facts. They need to be there, they need to be delivered, but it's how we deliver the facts about climate change, especially when those who are trying to distort the facts are using emotions to communicate. So we gotta get better than them, frankly. Um, why should people care is the second W. You know, why, how does climate change affect you? Um, how is it relevant to you? How is it relatable? I mean, I think all of us who arrived here in New York City this morning, I don't know if we can blame climate change for the rivers like flooding down Third Avenue, but it is really dramatic out there. Um, you know, the subway that I was riding on was slow because there was water in the tracks. Now, I don't know, you know, maybe, maybe this is climate change, maybe it isn't, but I think everybody now is feeling it. It's no longer the polar bear in the North Pole that we're feeling sorry for. Everybody either has directly been impacted by climate change or knows somebody who has. And we have now the opportunity to provide communications that is relatable and relevant and also not leaving people in the state of fear. And that's where the third W comes in, which is what now? What is the solution? And we have the solutions. That's the crazy thing. I mean, it's all laid out. And um, we never, we can, you know, can leave people with just disarmed in kind of fear. This problem is too big, too large, too intractable, um, which is what disinformation actors would like them to believe. No. There is something you personally can do. You can use your voice. You can take individual actions. You can advocate uh, for policy. And um, it isn't hopeless. Thank you. Thank you very much. Indeed, uh, that's part of the um, reality. And I, I agree with you. Um, uh, it impacts us uh, in multiple ways. And we, we, we see it. But I don't want to monopolize the conversation here in New York. And Dr. Dimitri, I will uh, relay that back to you. And, and of course, we're uh, open uh, to take uh, questions, comments, and um, look forward to actually in a, a, a good uh, interaction and engagement, uh, both uh, in Bucharest and New York. So please, Dr. Dimitri. Thank you very much. Uh, very comprehensive and um, fruit of thoughts for, um, on the topic. If we have any intervention here. Yes, please. Any question? Thank yes. you. Uh, my name is Ciprian Sanescu. I'm uh, running the Social Innovation Solutions Organization in Romania. And first of all, congratulations to all of you. Good morning and uh, happy rain day. Um, I have a funny story and an unpleasant question. The funny story is that we actually interacted with some of the Atlas Network last year while organizing the first edition of Climate Change Summit in Bucharest. Um, so we went online and um, had almost 1 million viewers on Twitter and YouTube. And uh, we could see uh, a river of uh, swearing and anti-climate uh, comments, especially in Twitter. We're talking about thousands, tens of thousands of comments. Um, so that was, uh, this is the bad thing. Um, now, this year, the summit takes place in October 19 and 20, and we're very happy to also have Mr. Bunchu with us and many ministers um, and mayors, uh, but also international guests. So um, what happened when we started to pay to, to ads, like to, to, you know, to pay for ads uh, on social media, is that the river of swearing came back. So um, our colleagues that are monitoring this, for the Climate Change Summit are every day deleting comments uh, and are looking very worried at shares. Now, what happened is very interesting, is that uh, by looking at the profiles of these individuals selectively, because there's too many to just do it manually, right? Um, you could see that they're the classical pattern um, that shares whatever you might imagine. Um, so this is the bad news. But there's also a very interesting good news. Uh, 
what happened both last year and again almost 1 million people watched and it was incredible there were equally that many people that combated these people but the real people not the trolls what happened this year on on in social media is that we had have the same reaction of people saying who are you to deny this and then we look at data and we're even a bit optimistic so every year before the climate change summit we do a study national urban rural study in romania and um, what we have found is that between 19 and 92 percent of romanians believe that climate change is real and that it has a negative impact it's not just real it has an impact about 55 percent of them believe that it has an impact on their personal life not just polar bears right um, and uh, there's a lot of data and that i'm not going to go into it but there's one particular set of data that says last year and two years ago and probably this year as well it says that um, it is the responsibility of the government to act but we believe the people believes that the government is not able to do that so we also need to do that so we do see action within the words of the, the people now the question the unpleasant question is um Obviously, um, and this is a more of a Romanian type of question, and I apologize to, to the international guests, but uh, um, next year is a difficult year in Romania um, because we have all four rounds of elections. So the question is to whomever would like to answer, um, how could we, all of us, uh, prepare for a new wave of social media-based uh, um, disinformation and uh, you, you get the point. Um, considering that climate change or climate deniers are most likely, um, some of them might be voters of some extremist parties. I'm not going to name them. Uh, and by the way, speaking of political will for climate action, I find it very relevant that we are in the palace of the parliament. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much. Very interesting story. And definitely we need to debate it and you'll have answers from the experts perspective and from the policy making perspective so Jenny yes yeah it, it, I, I know that Melissa had to leave but I, I'd like to pick up on a couple of themes that I think are really important um I am not a behavioral psychologist and so I, I you know I don't claim to have incredible expertise on that front but I think that we are at a point of a unique moment of precarity where people feel very little control over their future in a number of different ways. Climate change is a very obvious example of that. And as Melissa was saying, it is a deliberate tactic to try and exploit that sense of, of impotence to drive people into either you know, despair or apathy or to stop them with engaging with the topic. But also more and more people have direct experience of an extreme weather event or of you know, a, a, uh, a natural disaster that was compounded by climate change. And I think that the human response to those experiences can go in two different directions. The research that I have seen, which I think is still relatively new, suggests that when people have that kind of direct personal engagement with the topic because they've lived through something, it definitely puts climate higher on their agenda as a motivating issue, either as a voter or as a citizen. But again, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're driven towards being supportive of climate action. It means that they care more about climate change at an abstract level. And I think that it is also equally possible that the more and more you experience extreme weather, that you live through a drought, that you live through a wildfire, that you live through a heat wave, is actually the conspiracy theories become more appealing because they create meaning within chaos. That is what conspiracy theories do, is that they provide neat explanations to incredibly complex problems and pro complex dynamics. And so there is, a, there is a risk that as people don't feel in control, they do become more susceptible to those kind of ideas because it's a form of avoidance of saying, I, actually, climate change is so overwhelming and I feel that dread deep down, and the only way to deal with that dread and process that fear is to go into these kind of radical spaces. I will obviously let Mr. Manchu talk about the Romanian elections specifically, but um, I do think that communications around climate change need to be more attuned to the underlying themes of misinformation because they don't change. 
the specific conspiracy theories change, the specific lines of attack change. You know, they're always adapting and throwing new things at the wall and seeing what sticks. But the themes now are very consistent. It's about power. It's about civil liberties. It's about individual freedoms. It's about state overreach. It's about surveillance capitalism. It's about the dangers of multilateralism and authoritarianism. Those are the theories that drive everything from QAnon to the New World Order, to the Great Reset, you know, all of these big unifying conspiracy theories. And so, as, as Melissa was saying, in the way that you talk about climate and climate action, you cannot just be in the weeds on the technicalities of policy or even on the big picture. You need to be anchoring all of your communications around those themes, knowing that they are the kind of base fears and traumas that exist at the center of society at the moment. Thank you, Mark. So we we may get back to this if there are any questions, but now I really invite Mr. Banchu from the policymaker. Thank you. An, an excellent question, actually. And uh, I feel that we, we, we really have a, a very vivid discussion. It's not very surprising to me to hear your story uh, because we have, um, let's say, avoided some decisions related to the energy market and we have overlapped a local that became a global crisis of energy and when people and households felt the growth in the prices for their electricity bills they immediately connect this with the climate change topic because maybe of the lobby of the fossil industry but not only because of that, because also of misinformation and the way people generally get in contact with the information related to climate change. Um, we, had the, this, we had a decision uh, in June last year in the Council when we have, when Romania, um, together with other EU member states, decided to include the carbon taxation on uh, transportation and household heating and cooling systems. And we did not communicate about this because if we had communicated about this to the general public, they would immediately say, you are crazy. We will pay more because there were a lot of discussion and debates about the price of carbon that grew and that it had a huge influence on the bills. The reality was not the carbon price was high, but the reality was that the energy prices were, went very high. So the influence of the carbon pricing in the energy bill was not so high, but this was the general public perception. Going back to the elections, what we see now happening in the European level also in the parliament and in the council is that the ambitions, the green ambitions, tend to be not so high in the future. And we see now a growing concern about food security, which is real, and somehow a less ambitious uh, discussion about restoration targets, protected areas, uh, energy efficiency, and so on. And this will come. So I would love to live in a country where the climate discussions will become electoral discussions or proposals. I'm really curious to see it. For the moment, in the political spectrum in Romania, the climate discussions are somehow confiscated by a few and I don't have a real uh, statistics to understand how much of the Romanians would like to see ambitious climate policies proposed as electoral programs next year. I think this is the reality. We, we have done our own polls, and I have personally included questions in national white polls about if the Romanians would like to pay more if the prices of uh, renewable energy will be higher. And they said no. They all agree that the, they, and they understand the impacts of climate change. We have no seasons, we have no snow, the Christmas in Romania doesn't look like it used to look 20 years ago. But when it is about actions or policies or solutions to address the problem, then the polarization comes. And of course they will, always ask for the government to do something and the government will do policies and strategies but then the implementation phase is coming and we need to have businesses on board and people on board 
if they are not on board, if they are not going to 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 be part of this journey that will cost households and companies and entire societies uh, some efforts, including budgets, we will not succeed. In the same time, we all know that the cost of not doing the right things will be higher. And this is also a story that we need to tell. And I agree with what Jenny said. We need to communicate this. We need to communicate science in the way that people understand it. We need to communicate science in, in a way that politicians understand it. Because to be very frank, we don't have policies based on science. Sometimes we have policies based on uh, impressions, on, on, on feelings, on emotions that are not backed by science. So it is a very difficult and challenging effort that we need to invest to translate science so the people understand it, to translate science so the politicians understand it. And I think what, what, what Jenny said is very valid. We need to make people act, including by voting, let's say, green leaders, through emotions. They don't care about GEG emissions and calculations and the fact that the projections are showing that Romania did a very good job in terms of GEG uh, reductions, but they care about uh, the, per the, the people they know they are affected by floods or by drought, or uh, they care about the things like not being able to ski in Poyana Brasov in December. So I think we need to translate all these big topics into small ones that people really care and that will make people move in a certain way. Otherwise, it will be complicated. Thank you. Thank you. New York, any questions, any comments on the topic, please? Well, I would um, I would pick up on uh, what uh, Yunus Banchu was saying, uh, you know, uh, climate, climate change and food security is an important matter. And uh, we haven't addressed the um, uh, climate-driven uh, uh, conflicts, um, which um, may become more, uh, more acute in the future. We can see the evidence, even nowadays, in, in some parts of the world. And that's something that will have to stay with us. Now, I'm not myself um, a climate, uh, let's say, uh, um, expert, but I think, uh, I agree with the notion that we have to believe in science. We have to follow the science. The opposite of not following the science may kill many people and losing lives. We could see that during the pandemic. And that was the advice that we, we've been providing as governments, not, in Roman, not only in Romania, but also in, in Europe, across Europe and, and in, in, in the US, for example, as well. So uh, there's very much important to believe in the science. And if we... I mean, uh, my encouragement would be to focus less on debating whether the impact of climate change is real or not, but focusing on the action. And um, I heard it on numerous occasions, you know, those who have the privilege to watch this planet from space, uh, astronauts from the US or from Europe, they all say the same thing. This planet looks so fragile, so we have to take care of that. So looking at the dimension, you know, at the multiple dimensions of climate change, whether it's food security or uh, a conflict, but we have to believe uh, in science and to take that information for real because it is happening. We don't have the luxury, we don't have the knowledge as diplomats here in Europe, we don't have the knowledge of seeing at some point whether a particular storm is climate induced or not. But science can indicate whether a particular trend is worrisome or not. And the news that we get um, registering this year, the hottest month, the hottest summer, the highest temperature registered everywhere. In Europe as well, during the summer, it was so difficult to find a particular place in Europe during July or August uh, and to uh, stay outside during, uh, during the, uh, the peak of the day uh, without um, um, you know, uh, looking for, for shelter. And, and shadow. So it's with us, it's there. We have to take that into account. And now uh, looking at uh, the New York conversations, part of the debate is focused too much on who is responsible for that. And I have to say that um, uh, this conversation will be, becomes actually quite ideological. And we could see that again, um, 
um, picking up uh, in the run-up to the COP28. We could see that last week as well in, in the General Assembly in the Climate Change Summit, there is still that tendency to blame some of the countries for climate change, um, mainly the developed countries for producing and having the biggest climate fingerprint and, and climate emissions, which I think that's the wrong debate to have. Uh, we are all responsible and we all have to take action. And I would uh, definitely, again, bring into the dimension the, the fate of uh, small islands developing states and states with a low coastline. That's something that is uh, vigorously debated in New York um, in different formats, in the Security Council, as I mentioned, in the General Assembly, in regional formats. There is a sense of need of desperate action because that's actually what is happening. And that's why the uh, treaty beyond national jurisdiction is very much important because it places the responsibility on all of us. What is happening in our oceans is, is part of our common responsibility. And we will not be able to address that challenge just individually by ourselves. We provide source of inspiration in Europe through the European Union uh, measures and actions and plans. And I think uh, comparing notes with others on how we uh, can uh, improve our action um, is feasible and we will definitely do that in, uh, in, in New York as well, as Romania and as member of the European Union as group of like-minded countries. And um, this would be my, uh, my take on, on the comments that were made uh, so far in Bucharest. I don't know if you would like to, please. Dr. Thank you very much, Ambassador. And it's a very nice um, discussion in the framework that we have um, just seen in the last an hour. I think uh, what was mentioned from our colleagues in Eucharist about the, uh, the experience that people go through uh, of the environmental disasters of, of, or of the impact uh, makes a big uh, change in the way they look at climate change. Um, you talked about the floods um, in Pakistan uh, last year uh, and how uh, the UN has responded to that call for uh, helping and assisting in the recovery and relief. Um, the day before yesterday when the General Assembly uh, got a briefing from the Secretary General and other high-level UN agencies about the work that they have done, um, it took me back uh, when I visited that place uh, earlier this year with our head of agency and see the impact on 33 million people. So these 33 million people will not have any doubt uh, along with other billions who are affected in other parts of the world that climate change has a bad impact on their lives. And for them uh, and for many others of millions in the global south, in Africa, uh, small island states, it's a matter of life. So it's not just a matter of good life, it's a matter of existential threat. And that message, sometimes it is felt, is not conveyed sufficiently to uh, people through the media uh, because of the reasons that we just heard. So the underlying themes of global uh, communication and climate will perhaps also uh, need to amplify the negative impact of climate and energy crisis on people who are far off, not only the polar bear, but the actual human beings who get to this, and not now, but for the last 20, 25 years, uh, how they are impacted and how uh, their lives, human lives and societies are impacted. I think uh, since it's a global issue, which knows which knows no boundaries, whether that is the marine ecosystem or whether that is the air pollution or, or, or other impacts of global heat. Today, we heard that Hong Kong was having the hottest day uh, in, in late September, and in other parts, it's different. So um, the communication should also um, perhaps have an aggregated um, output on how climate is viewed by different segments and how climate is viewed by different sectors. That will help us come to a more informed view and informed decision-making and policy-making. Because it's not just science, it's the effect on the ground also. 
and to 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 make uh, a movement for more active climate action on ground, these stories need to be told more clearly. Um, I know uh, the media has its own um, angles and media has its own interests, some of them vested, which will uh, at times uh, prioritize things in a different way. But uh, as an international community, uh, as the Secretary General has been saying it repeatedly, uh, all of us will have to fulfill our own responsibilities in a way which will have an, uh, have an effect on others and uh, make global action for climate more urgent. Uh, on the point which Melissa had raised about environmental activists and environmental uh, movements, I think I will subscribe to that in a big way. Uh, she is one of those who makes a very strong message in a very soft tone. Um, we have issues also with environmental defenders. Uh, some of the environmental defenders in different parts of the world get uh, prosecuted and get uh, uh, restricted for uh, their activism, for their advocacy of climate and environment. And these issues um, are also having effect on the way um, the way people perceive uh, the will of their uh, authorities on climate. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ahmad. Um, if there are no other comments or questions from, from us here in New York, anyone? Yes, oh, yes. maybe if I may, uh, sorry, probably it's difficult to see my, my, my yes, hands please, raised. Yes, please, please, and then we'll come back to New York. Thank you. I just wanted to, to uh, join the colleagues on a couple of reflections that have been made. Clearly, there is a need to, to change the communication and to improve the communication. One element that we've seen in the, in the risk reduction agenda that really works in order to address what Jenny was saying, how do we make people from uh, recognize uh, the challenge towards becoming active in taking uh, actions towards it, um, is awareness. Awareness is something that we need to work more because it's going to be creating a very important balance between the facts and the figures and the scientific community element with the, the reality of, uh, of the people. Because it, it, the awareness is created very often through experiences that have been lived by people, uh, by the promotion of certain actions that already work and or might not have worked. So I think this is an, an important consideration that can really help um, government also to connect uh, a positive um, interaction with our society uh, in order to ensure that we are actually move the, the fear, the frustration uh, towards implementation and actions that are going to be supporting um, the agenda. So in the disaster risk reduction agenda, um, awareness is fundamentally important and the early warning experience is the difference between hearing the noise of the sirens and acting upon it is how the population has been engaged in the process of creating the early warning system. And I think this is also uh, another important lesson that we can share in the way in which we are communicating and in the way in which we are creating awareness. We need really to work from the start with the community and with the society. And if, if you think about the youth and what a potential we have uh, with, the, with, with youth and youth, youth activities, we could really do quite a lot in this regard. Thank you. Thank you. And indeed, the awareness is very much important. Just, just this morning, I think uh, our um, mobile phones in the New York area received uh, alert messages for the uh, you know, uh, weather reports which is quite important to, to alert people and to make them aware that something um, 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 you know, more extreme may, may be coming up. But we have a, a comment or a question from, from here. Please, sir, you have the floor. I was in the Marshall Islands for two years. My favorite word there is tuna. And that is when the birds are feeding on the fish, the large fish are forcing the small fish up to the surface, they're jumping out and the birds are feeding on them. At goal 14 is life below the water, and as we communicate, it's important to remember that the oceans 
are associated with life, not just under the water, but in the air. We have environmentalists who love the polar bears. We have some who love birds, but uh, this is such a rich environment and it's not just the ocean and what's underneath, but also the ocean when it inundates the land of these small islands, contaminating the uh, reservoirs and the aquifers and ruining agriculture. So as we communicate this, it's not just for those people that love fish, but uh, really life on earth. Thank you. Absolutely. And um, we could witness uh, just recently uh, here in New York, uh, NASA introduced a study on the uh, on how Tuvalu is affected by uh, by climate change and uh, sea level rise, and also uh, pointing to the uh, to the marine life that is uh, under serious threat. So this is actually this is a very real dimension of, of the conversation, and uh, you know something that we have to deal with. So back to Bucharest now, Dr. Dimitriou. Thank you very much. Um, any questions? Um, I would like to get back to the role of science. Yes, okay, please. And then back to me on, on the science. Hello, my name is Raluca Nicolai and I'm from Natura 5 NGO. I would like to ask you, what would be the main steps to follow in order to correctly identify the misleading information news from an expert point of view at uh, working at UN level? Well, I'm afraid we have only the expert on my left. So Jenny. I mean, I mean, that's a tough question. Do you mean for you as an individual, like if you are navigating the online yes, space? Yes. How, okay, wow. Um, okay, uh, so I mean, there are there are certain ways to interrogate content, or I think to really think about the way that you consume content as an individual that should apply across the board, right? The social media space, relies on engagement, it is optimized for engagement. And I don't think that users, they know that at the back of their head, they know that these platforms have been designed to make sure that you doom scroll until you fall asleep, right? That you're just there for as long as possible, six hours a day. But still, when you're engaging with content, you don't view it that way. And you think that it's just a an open free speech environment, but it's not, it's a curated speech environment. And this content is being curated to keep you online. So you need to keep that in the back of your mind every time you're viewing something that looks like it's the viral trend that day, or it's the top thing, is not to immediately dismiss it, but to say, okay, well, what is the algorithm rewarding here? It's usually rewarding divisive content, hateful content, conspiratorial content, because that's what keeps people engaged. So at a very base level, I think, navigating the online space constantly with that in the back of your mind and realizing that just because you're seeing something in your newsfeed, it doesn't mean that it's mainstream opinion and it doesn't mean that it's the real world. I think this comes back to the first question that the gentleman opposite me was asking about what do you do when you get floods of disinformation? Don't be deceived by a very vocal minority. They are deliberately weaponizing the online space to make sure that their ideas seem like they are popular opinion. And they're incredibly good at doing that. That is the tactical playbook of information operations is you are vocal enough and you are committed enough as an actor online that you constantly rise to the surface. And then what happens? The mainstream media start reporting on your points of view and more users are engaging with your content. So it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. So that's one thing. The second thing I think is, you know, basic, basic tools of sort of media and digital literacy in looking at sources and verifying sources. So, you know, there are plenty of signals when you go onto a web website that would indicate that website may not be a credible source. It's URL whether or not it has citations under its images, whether or not it has citations for its statistics. These things sound very simple, but when people are consuming content so rapidly, even if they pride themselves on being a kind of rational person, if the thing confirms what you wanted to believe in the first place, you kind of forget that you were meant to check those things and you just share it, right? I, I used to do this and then I set myself a very strict rule which was that i could not share an article with somebody if i had not read the article from top to bottom myself oh my god it made my life so much harder because i just was reading the headlines and then sharing them with people who i thought would be interested but like my biggest piece of advice to everybody is slow down that is the best way to sort fact from fiction 
slow down, create friction in your own consumption of content, by which I mean the gap between reading something and doing something with the thing that you've read. The gap between seeing a post that annoys you or inspires you or whatever, and sharing it or commenting on it, that's where media literacy really sits. It's not in immediately being able to tell because you're some, I don't know, guru, that what is fact and what is false, but it's that you don't let your own biases immediately inform the way that you respond to content online. And that you, of course, use verifiable sources, cross-check everything, use lateral reading, all of those simple things. But I think the bigger cultural shift that needs to happen is that friction and the fact that not everything needs to happen spontaneously and instantaneously. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jenny. Yes, please. I hope I can also ask a question, and this also to Jenny, but I think it it um, uh, it concerns all of us. When we have to take political decision, we are also somehow influenced by the public perception and not necessarily by the scientific evidence. And we see uh, also in the environmental and climate decisions that we have vocal minorities. I consider them vocal minorities, and I need to check this. I mean, if there is a topic that is very high on social media, we tend to prioritize it and answer to it because we don't have time or the resources to do polls and really go into the statistics of is this really a topic that concerns a majority of the population and that we need to address it? Is there any mechanism that is cheaper than doing polls all the time on or or you know referendums or whatever consultation that take time and resources to decide okay i have a vocal group that maybe is only 10 percent of the total population how can i differentiate what is relevant for the, the entire society because i'm a political leader and i need to take decision and you know balance different different needs is there any tool to do this I mean, again, I'm not I'm not a not a political operative in that sense. And I but I do think so. Firstly, I would encourage everyone to get out of their own social media bubbles. So when you say politicians are basing decisions on what they're seeing online, it's not like they're checking 10 different platforms. They're using their own news feeds, which is probably, let's be realistic, Twitter. They're using Twitter um, in like in many countries. But in other countries, you know, or, or, or Facebook, but I mean, it's one platform, right? It's the central platform that has the most currency within that context. So they're not even basing their decisions on the online environment. They're basing it on their very narrow sliver of the online environment. So the first easy thing that you can do is deliberately follow or try to occupy a diversity of spaces online. Follow accounts that you know represent different constituencies within society. The bigger problem, I think, for you will be that actually the majority of the population probably doesn't have an opinion on the vast amount of what you're working on because they don't even know that it exists, right? So it's not like you're going to be able to go out and find out find out what people think about, I don't know, incineration mechanisms or the pivot towards hydroelectric. They just not it's not on their radar at all. So it's not like there's necessarily an opinion that you're not seeing. It's just that the people who do have an opinion are very dedicated to that opinion. And beyond doing public opinion polling, I think the biggest um, tool at your disposal is to try and interrogate the vested interests behind those small groups. So really good example. In the UK uh, last year, there was briefly this, this big public controversy about whether or not the UK public wanted a referendum on net zero. And we, behind the scenes, as ISD, were getting messages from politicians, from people really at the front line of policymaking saying, should we be concerned about this? Like, is, is this actually where we're headed? Do, do we need to start to mobilize for some form of public plebiscite on the whole notion of net zero? And the reason that they thought that was because about 10 accounts online, some of whom also are hosts on particular media outlets, broadcast, print, radio, made it a controversy out of nowhere. And they were all talking about it. And they're very well networked and they have 
big organic reach and they also have these other platforms at their disposal. And when we actually looked at how many people were mentioning the terms net zero referendum across social media, it was like flatlined completely. And the only spikes that existed were when these 10 individuals all started talking to themselves about it or went onto their television shows and did a segment on it. And then people would mock it online. But from the politician's perspective, all they saw was the very the very surface thing, which is, oh, this is trending, right? And there's not the time and the capacity to interrogate it. Whereas if they had, they would have seen there was a vested interest there. There was a political agenda at play from a very small group. And it's really easy to comparatively assess the spread of the conversation and the engagement with the conversation more broadly than that. But I think that is happening all the time and we're not catching it. A lot of the time we were lucky in this instance that we could give them immediate intelligence to say lower the temperature it's not this is not this is not um this is not a public issue but you can see how the process from that is you have the small minority then the politicians and the media start getting worried and talking about it and then suddenly actually there is more public support for the idea of a net zero referendum because suddenly people are like oh i'd never considered that before maybe i should and so they kind of retrofit public support it's a very very sophisticated tactic so i wouldn't say you need to be every day doing forms of public opinion polling but occupy diverse spaces also talk to real people in the real world it's always a good one you know like ask the people in the cafes that you're with or talk to people on the tube next to you or you know there are ways of um experiencing human opinion that do not require us to be online and i think sometimes we sort of forget that that still exists thank you any other questions i would like to uh, raise the issue of science and community engagement, because it, it was discussed in New York, and definitely we need uh, evidence-based. And we have IPCC reports. But when they are translated to society, it depends on the channel, on the voices. Many times there is no money. We have here an IPCC leader. I'm also one of the IPCC leaders. And um, how can these messages be conveyed to society, to different groups of society, because in the room, if I look around, we have representatives of several stakeholders. Do we have industry here? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. Now, uh, so um, what I've seen over the years, uh, I'm thinking now about the movement of NGOs which started 30 years ago at the environmental movement, but now they are more and more professional and they're credible. So I would like to see the perspective from a Romanian NGO in terms of conveying data from science to communities and selecting different levels of community, geographical, yeah, in villages, in cities and so on, because I guess one of the tools that we really need to consider is the right information to go to people. Climate is a threat, it's the biggest, the yeah, climate change, biggest threat. How we deal with it, we've discussed today about resilience, it's only opening, you see, the way of tackling the resilience. We've heard, yeah, from regional, national level, uh, UN level, we heard about the role of uh, misinformation and delaying actions. But how can we really engage with communities? I've been living in UK for 23 years, and the first thing that I've learned there, it was community engagement. And it took me one year to understand what it meant, and community spirit. And then I went back to the approach of the village of my grandparents, and it, in fact, it was the same spirit. They all belonged to that place, and they wanted the place to be clean, and they were proud of the place, and so on. So how can we convey messages that now they are definitely in conflict and very difficult to convey to uh, uh, different um, parts of society? What will be the role of NGOs? And I, I'm very honest, I can tell you about being a climate skeptic. So I'm a researcher. Last year, during the COP27 in Sharm el Sheikh, I was in the Saudi Arabia pavilion. And I really liked what I saw. And I was with an American colleague from California. 
both researching transition to renewable energy and definitely roadmaps towards climate change implementation. And I was thinking if what I see is for real or is kind of show display, okay, they have these technologies and I saw several UK companies there, by the way, and Americans. Um, so it's fine in climate, I don't see competition because we have a global agenda. So I'm always advocating for joint intervention, working together, no matter with whom, just to move in the positive direction and implement things. Because if we're gathering them, talking and talking, then we delay the implementation. And what we have at the global level in, in climate, we have the countries, because it's the, the yeah, conference of parties. And then now for 10 years, it's a movement from the industry and from financial institutions from bottom up to implement things, to see it happening. And this will be seen as happening when there is a profit or an, an um, economic reason. So what my colleagues said, because I said, I don't believe that they want to implement what I see here, because it looks too good to be true. For instance, I can see and, and, and uh, I am aware of technologies to obtain hydrogen from waste. We have it in UK. Still, I don't see it implementing. Yeah, in Romania, not only in different countries, waste is a problem. And the way that we, uh, waste can be a benefit. So just one topic. So my question was, now they are sitting on oil. They definitely have this, uh, um, let's say, asset to advocate uh, with, and I'm not sure if they will implement what I see. And my colleague from US said, well, if they see that economically speaking, the technology will make sense, and this is what the renewable will come and resilience with this, yeah, hand in hand, because we're not talking uh, only about mitigating climate change, adaptation to climate change, putting money for a resilience plan is, is extremely important, and it came more and more in, in the last five years. So. Going back to communities, engagement, how can we convince communities using data from science? Who can help me here? From Romania and then from UK. Do you want to ask the room or can I wish to ask the room? I asked the room, that's why I said Romania first. Okay. And then... If, if nobody not, wants, I can go again. So in short, how we do it and, and what communities mean means sorry um is that we try to go to where the key stakeholders are that become multipliers so we do work with the government that is a community in itself we do work with i think all of the business associations so i don't i cannot speak in behalf, on behalf of the industry but uh why not in the end um and to some with, with not most NGOs that are active in the environment, but not just environment, also agriculture, energy, um, finance, etc. Um, and what we see, at least at a um, conversational level, is that there is no real denial uh, in these communities, and including in other communities called student communities, where we also operate across the country, of a denial perspective. Um, so. Perhaps we also, all of us, need to change a bit the framework of how we talk about climate change because we mainly talk about the problem, which is very important. But I'd say we, we sort of understand that there's a problem or problems and they're very connected, etc. So I think that there is a momentum that we need to uh, create that is talking about solutions, not necessarily about problems. Now, hydrogen is a solution to some extent. Um, by the way, I also think the Saudi Arabia pavilion was the best. Also, the Romanian one was very good. Um, but in the same time, uh, it's about how we fund these solutions. And now we have the money for that. And how we make sure that these solutions are stable for the long run. And we can also do that also with the support of EU money, but also with the support of the or a, a very small vocal minority of the population that, w as NGOs could be called, uh, also watchdogs. So I think, um, and to reference to Mr. Bunch's uh, perspective uh, and to Jenny's perspective, uh, or Mrs. King's perspective, I apologize, um, is the fact that sometimes the vocal, the very small vocal minorities can also be very right. Uh, and even if there's 15 people that say we should not hunt for squirrels, or I don't know what, because of the biodiversity of the place, 
um, um, we should also listen to that. So the effort needs to be higher, not lower. Um, now, how we also talk to communities, and I think a lot of NGOs here do that, is through the people that we try to, I wouldn't say teach, but show um, uh, issues related to how we can uh, become better. Now, this, the biggest challenge that I think most NGOs have in Romania, at least, but also around the region, is related to capital. Uh, it's not knowledge. Uh, I think we have even more than some other actors. Um, and we do have act. We, yeah. Uh, one second. Or you want to? Lovely. Yeah. Thanks. Um, so it's a it's a matter of capital, but also a matter of know how when it comes to uh, the business models of NGOs. So I think this is if you want to look into if I would look into the future of climate action and and how we support you know anti uh, disinformation etc i think one of the main challenges is how can we all of us ideally uh, support ngos in our countries to actually develop sustainable or financial models same financial models that take them away from uh, what we could call uh, the uh, entrapment of corporate uh, sponsorships or even the entrapment <laughs> of EU funding and support them into de designing new financial models that help them have the capital that they need to do the studies that Mr. Banchi was talking about to go to, uh, from, uh, I don't know, uh, Videle to uh, Panchu and talk to people in pubs and bars and so on. Um, but uh, I think we have a, an intervention there. I don't want to take. Thank you, Anel. Oh, very all. useful. Thank you very much. Um, yeah. I'm going to come here with a perspective or maybe an answer to the solution, uh, to the problem from a more defense strategic point of view. And I'm going to iterate why. So I think right now we are missing a great opportunity to fight climate change by using the context, however sad, of the war in Ukraine. Why? Because there's ever increasing attention towards the problem of, like we mentioned here, resilience, strategic, strategic planning, and uh, the way that we defend our territories. There's a great issue. I attended the NATO Youth Summit. So although it's a youth summit, there are experts talking there about my, the crisis of migration because of climate change and how they could increase funding and ask for more funding to certain organizations to promote the idea that there's a serious issue based on the issue of defense. You know, there's serious stress put on institutions because of the increase in migration. And I also think that this is a great thing to talk about in the context of the sea, since that's a main transfer, main way of transporting the people that are migrating from the global south, for instance. So I think in order to reach more voices, reach more funding, also try to address this audience, the audience concerned with defense, with um, the security of their countries, from the perspective of also migration, um, and the overall being in the context of a more stable climate. Yeah, I don't know, maybe it's a prohibition, but I'm looking forward to the panel interpreting this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, please. Uh, I am a scientist, uh, Roxana Bojariu from National Meteorological Administration. And it's a very interesting uh, issue how to uh, transfer science. And I think uh, um, a good way is to uh, start from local knowledge, which is distillated over time and uh, could be sometimes very, very uh, good at uh, leverage the scientific um, message. And uh, you could bring community around this local knowledge, offering the base to um, uh, put people in this uh, situation of uh, uh, understanding uh, science. Uh, so it's very important that uh, all of us should uh, um, just uh, pass over our uh, square. <laughs> uh, for example, scientists should go to local knowledge because it's interesting to see how this common sense distillated over uh, uh, centuries sometimes uh, is uh, very coherent and also uh, uh, NGOs coming to a particular site, uh, they could find uh, inspiration uh, knowing other particular sites and so on. So yeah, I think uh, local knowledge could be a very good start. Thank you very much. Uh, we've experienced this with uh, Natura 5 in Denver Delta, local based solutions, they know better than we from the office and all science around because they live there and they have the climate resilience happening 
12 months. So good. Uh, any other Romanian perspective? Because before I give the floor to UK. Hmm? I no. <laughs> this is the forum of friends, and we have uh, yeah representatives from different parts of society, and it's a kind of learning by doing. Because one of the objective of today's meeting is awareness, and then trying to assign some actions for everybody. So to to learn something, to we'll discuss about this as a takeaway. Yeah. Okay. Please don't take my words as the words of the UK. I'm not, not here as, a, as an ambassador of the country, but, but my own personal thoughts. One thing for, from the comment over here, climate migration is now being identified by many ministries of defense and multilateral institutions as kind of the key security issue, right? It's gonna be an aggravated, already an aggravating factor for conflict, has been for 10 years. And I don't think that we should deny that reality. I am, nervous about the idea of bringing people on board around climate action using migration as the frame because I think the danger is that it becomes a very xenophobic conversation where essentially you're saying we need to tackle climate change because we don't want people from overseas to come here and I, I that is already rhetoric within the region and it preys on nativist politics it preys on isolationism it is Already, you know, there is an enormous amount of scapegoating of asylum seekers and refugees in various different countries all around the world. And I'm concerned about that being the sort of motivating factor for people caring about this issue. So it's not that I, I disagree with your point, but I think it needs to be very carefully framed so that the message isn't, if we don't deal with climate change, your society is gonna be flooded with people who don't look like you. Um, and it's very easy for that to become the kind of conclusion that's drawn. Um, and so it's sort of the means to the end, to me, are not justified. Um, on how we engage communities, my, my background is more in, in that, that space. I worked a lot on cultural relations in the past, um, on social cohesion work. And I think that we often are not very creative in who we consider to be the gatekeepers of conversations in society. We're sort of all aware of the fact that there is a complete whole scale erosion of trust in institutions, right? People don't trust governments. They don't trust the media. They increasingly don't even trust academia and science. They don't trust multilateral institutions. We know that. We also know that people get their information from online influencers. But those are not the only people in society that have a relationship with the general public. And I wanna take one example that I, I love, I use it a lot, and it always makes people laugh because I guess it seems a little bit absurd, but I really think it's indicative of a more creative way of approaching a problem, which is that in the UK, there has traditionally been an issue with, with suicide amongst the black British male community. And that community has also not culturally had a, um, a reputation of talking openly about mental health. So not only was it a problem, but there wasn't an immediate way of dealing with the problem because there was not open discussions. And it was identified from people within that community that one of the places that, you know, the black British men do spend a lot of time is with their barbers, with their hairdressers, right? And that it is kind of a stereotype for all of us that we all spill our secrets or vent or say what's on our mind when we're having our hair cut. So this, this entity worked with barbers across the city to train them in psychosocial skills, not so that they could become people's therapists because that's very dangerous, you know, they're not, they're not medically trained, but so that they could try to tease out whether people were in a moment of crisis and guide them towards effective forms of support. It's just, it, it, it's such a, a brilliant case study for really trying to think not from the position of a system trying to talk down to people, but from the position of a person who needs help or needs information and where they're most likely to get that from in a trustworthy way. In the past, my organization has also worked with religious leaders, right? People are incredibly engaged with their religious institutions. They see them as locuses of community. People engage a lot with their employers. So in Germany, we do digital citizenship training with 75 of the biggest employers in the country because they're the only point of entry really to an adult demographic, right? You can't reach them at school, they've left school. 
Where do you talk to them? You talk to them in their workplaces. Social workers, sports clubs, huge amount that's been done, not just in the UK, but in lots of countries about using sports clubs to advocate around issues like racism, issues like misogyny, why not climate? Your pop cultural sector, you now have a lot more artists who are trying to make their tours carbon neutral, who are, who are thinking about the industry and its role in sustainability. There are all of these different intermediaries who hold a different kind of relationship with the public and also engage with them on a regular basis, social workers, nurses, trade unions, right? But when we talk about educating the public, we still generally refer to a very narrow band of institutions, formal education, the media, government, and not much more than that. So I, I, I think it's sort of about, imagine a, a week in your own life and the people who you talk to during that week. And that's a good starting point for beginning to draw up a list of more, more creative forms of, of community engagement. Thank you very much, very comprehensive. Um, approach who has any comments if not i any okay just, thank you just a yes, second thank you wonderful genie in the, we agree with your point of view actually you mentioned here a lot of let's say missions and tasks from euro atlantic resilience center we are engaged in this process it's very long a little powerful a little uh, uh, and um, the mission is difficult. It's difficult because it's a matter of education, education people, generation, different level of education. And that takes us a lot of time. We have to be understandable and to convince the people, the generation, the new generation and the old generation to change their habits and to take into consideration the future of the planet. Anyhow, wonderful speech you have. Thank you. So if there is no other comment or suggestions uh, or question to New York for the concluding remarks, and then we'll have the, the last word here in Bucharest. Thank you very much. And um, it was um, a real pleasure to, uh, to follow that exchange, uh, useful exchange uh, in Bucharest. And uh, thank you for that. Uh, I would like to give the floor to uh, Mr. Ahmad, please. Thank you very much. And uh, just to um, have a small comment on the very interesting discussion about engaging uh, local communities and engaging NGOs on the ground for conveying the message of science on climate. Um, the purpose of all these scientific assessments and reports, uh, what is wrong, but maybe two uh, points or two pillars highlighted are, are more. Um, in the front. One uh, is to influence policy. Uh, so that's why um, we at UNEP uh, give uh, major attention to the science policy interface at our United Nations uh, legislative bodies, where this science informs the policies which are implemented by local authorities. But the other one is to, to create a behavioral change. Um, and, and we heard uh, a lot about how behavioral change can be uh, impacted and affected by even barbers uh, in some 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 aspects, whether that's the mental health or environmental health of the planet. So behavioral change um, can only be uh, effective when the impact of climate is related to human directly. When we tell somebody that uh, if we don't act, uh, the this and that aspect of climate will have a direct bearing on your life. And a good example of that, uh, which we have experienced in the UN, is the issue of air pollution. Uh, in Asia, um, the air pollution issue is enormous. Some of the cities uh, are so much polluted that uh, living there uh, reduces the average life expectancy by multiple years, in some cases five, in some cases six, in seven. So um, local authorities and especially civil society and NGOs have taken upon themselves in many of those areas and cities and countries to convey to the local people the impact of science, the impact of air pollution and the results of science uh, at the local level to raise awareness and also to 
transaction. As a result, we see uh, uh, governments are also then uh, forced to take action for cleaning air um, through conversion, through um, electric mobility or cleaner fuels or to more investment in uh, transport sector and industry sector to have a clean air. So um, unless and until uh, the climate uh, problem is related to human experience, uh, science will struggle to make an impact of conveying the message. Thank you. And I think, uh, Mr. Amar, this is an important takeaway because um, every one of us is definitely uh, impacted by, by, by the climate change. We can see it in our day-to-day -day life. Um, we can see it wherever we are in major cities, um, whether you know we encourage or, or discourage uh, electric mobility and how we um, we put to a good use the um, uh, the the resources we have. Now um, there are some very valid points uh, in Bucharest on the uh, information disinformation and how what we can do at the level of the communities. Um, I think that probably we shouldn't be that defensive because unfortunately and regretfully. Um, the developments are ahead of us. And um, the wildfires, for example, that happened throughout the summer in Europe or different floods that are happening in, in Europe are a painful reminder to every citizen, not only to governments as well, that cl the climate is changing, that uh, we need to take action. And of course, it is, it is mentioned by, by, by Melissa Fleming at the beginning, echoing comments by the Secretary General, there is a cost for inaction, and we cannot afford not to take action. Um, we also have to look at the battle of the narratives. We talked about disinformation, but there is also a battle of the narratives. One narrative uh, promoted by governments, unfortunately, is not through social media, it's promoted through uh, regular government channels. Uh, it was quite puzzling to get that message from um, a member state that actually is uh, basing its own development on fossil fuel, uh, that climate change is not happening, that what we are witnessing is at the result of the climate cycles in the history of, of humanity. And this is uh, completely wrong. The other narrative that is uh, shaping up, and I alluded to that, is who is responsible for that and who should pay. That's why the discussion on the loss and damage is a bit more complicated. And probably we have to move away from that because it, it concerns all of us. And hopefully, again, the BBNJ may be a good vehicle to overcome uh, those differences. Uh, no matter what, I think we are asked to take real action because we are um, going to influence the lives of the future generations. And we made it quite clear. We did it as well in Romania in the General Assembly. We are borrowing from the following generations, resources. And we are actually uh, owing to the following generations. And some of the generations are not even uh, born, uh, we are owing to them uh, that level of um, involvement and action that would uh, protect uh, everything we do, not only the environment, but you know, our economies will create predict predictability and, and security uh, overall, because it's about that as well. Migration is also an important aspect. So climate is a reality. Climate is influencing the way governments operate, is beyond decisions taken at the national level to uh, encourage a green transition. I think it's also part of our logic and the way we see it here as well to serve to the better, uh, to the best of our abilities, the security environment. And that's very much important. And that's one key takeaway that uh, we uh, we have from, from this conversation. Um, the group that attended this meeting is somehow a like-minded group and that's important. And I think we have a duty to echo that message uh, in um, our interactions to make sure that um, we are ahead of the curve and we are not waiting for the next crisis to happen, a climate crisis to hit and then to, uh, um, you know, um, assess the consequences. Uh, it's happening, it's here, and we are behind the curve. So we have to uh, take immediate action. And I'm very glad that your Atlantic uh, Resilience Center uh, in Bucharest um, profiled this and um, uh, looked at this topic um, with multiple actors. We could see through our conversation from Bucharest, uh, New York, Geneva, that there are multiple angles that we are looking at this. There is the micro level, there is the macro level, there is a global approach. 
but that's very much important and many stakeholders. And um, uh, I feel myself encouraged by this conversation. I, I want to thank uh, our participants from, from New York, from, um, from Geneva, and of course to thank uh, Bucharest for facilitating this conversation. And I'm very glad the technology worked. And we have to take a moment to pause and to reflect would that, how complicated such a triplex would have been three years, no, four years ago, right? Before the pandemic, we would have not even pictured uh, such a conversation. It's efficient because we did not travel in a particular location to be physically present, uh, but nevertheless, we capitalized on the knowledge that every of the participants has. So I want to thank you um, very much for this, uh, for this, um, a contribution for this uh, very encouraging debate and we will take this message forward and i look forward to future engagements thank you very much thank you new york so now the panel came to the concluding remarks and usually after a panel uh, we would like the organizers the audience to have some takeaways and from the the New York and Bucharest sites that we could see the climate and the resilience was tackled in different aspects and angles. We've heard about pollution, which immediately goes to health. And it seems that climate resilience is part of our everyday life. So this may be one takeaway. Community engagement is also part of our life because we are part of community. How to engage with communities it's a fruit of soul. Awareness, it was mentioned several times in a right way. Yeah, so organize awareness, identify segments of society. But what we can see, yeah, we are only at the start of this information about this information and denial and, and green wash. So personally, I would suggest, and. I hope that my colleagues from Natura 5 uh, will agree with me uh, to keep on this initiative and to add, for instance, climate literacy, which in UK is quite a topic, and this can help a lot conveying the right message to different parts of society. So for, for next year, let's say. And of course, I thank you panelists, I thank you, the audience, that you came and stayed here yeah, on Friday evening, and this is great, and this shows that climate is part of our everyday life, and it is. And I guess that in the end, the solutions is our, in our hands, but we have to treat it collectively. So everybody, we used to say, everybody is doing his own bits, but we have to gather, discuss, identify our ways to help the resilience, to identify the, the infrastructure, to see our role because it's helping us. Thank you very much, everybody, and goodbye. <laughs>